Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte Copeland. I'm the historian and archivist for our Pulaski County Rack and Sack Folklore Society, and I'm just one of our many player members. For me, it's the guitar, vocals, and sometimes harmonica. I'll tell you more about our other acoustic instruments later in this presentation. It's a pleasure to tell you about Rack and Sack and to share with you some of our traditional old-time music. Since we always begin our programs with a hoedown, let's start with one now. Here's Soldier's Joy, followed by My Own House Waltz, along with some pictures of our Rack and Sack players. <laughs> I'll be talking about several subjects during this fairly brief presentation, namely our mission, defining rack and sack and old time music, our beginnings, the musical instruments we play, the origins of our songs and tunes, and our players. The mission of the Rack and Sack Folklore Society is to preserve traditional folk music through performance on acoustic instruments. We are a nonprofit organization and we function under a board of directors and an established set of bylaws. We strive to accomplish our mission in several ways. Under normal circumstances, we hold free monthly musical gatherings. The public is invited. We currently have about 150 members and of that number, about 50 are performing members. Throughout the year, we also perform at festivals, civic functions, private parties, retirement homes, and for many charitable organizations. We play every year in Mountain View up in the Stone County Ozarks for the Arkansas Folk Festival and also the Jimmy Driftwood Tribute at the Jimmy Driftwood Barn. Over the years, we have played all around Central and Northern Arkansas, 
and at the governor's mansion several times, as well as the state capitol. The name Rackensack is so unusual, and many ask about its origin, so let's spend just a minute on that. According to Oxford Dictionaries Online, Rackensack refers to, quote, a nickname for the state of Arkansas achieved by a humorous twist of letters to produce an internal rhyme, unquote. Arkansas, Rackensack. I have found historical references to Rackensack going back to the 1840s, shortly after Arkansas achieved statehood. There was an Arkansas fighting group in the Mexican War of 1846 to 1848 who called themselves Rackensackers and carried the famous Bowie knife, as well as a banner that read, Rackensack is in the field. Also in 1847, a Cincinnati firm published two musical works together on the same page. One was the now famous Arkansas Traveler, and the other was Rackensack Waltz, with a variant spelling, but reinforcing the early and close association of Arkansas and Rackensack. One of the most interesting early usages occurred in the November 9, 1850 issue of Household Words, a weekly magazine published in London and edited by Charles Dickens. Yes, that Charles Dickens. In an unsigned story entitled Sloped for Texas, we read, quote, It is the boast of the young bloods of the state of Rackensack in Arkansas that they are born with skins like alligators and with strength like bears. They work hard and they play hard. Gaming is the recreation most indulged in, and the gaming houses of the western part of Arkansas have branded it with an unenviable notoriety. End quote. Arkansas was one of several frontier states, including Texas, that became the objects of quite a bit of British humor. There were also Rackensacker units in the Civil War and in the Spanish-American War, but we haven't found references for the two world wars or the Korean and Vietnam wars. More recently, the name was used during the Iraq War as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2008 with the motto, I'm quoting here, Rackensackers lead the way to hell and back. What is meant by traditional music or folk music. The key to understanding the music we seek to preserve is in the word traditional, that is, the passing down from generation to generation certain elements of a culture. In our folk music, some call it old-time music, and now we also hear roots music as well as Americana. It's the songs and tunes extending back to such origins as the British Isles, much of Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean islands. Let's hear how a Scottish composer and musicologist, the late David Johnson, defined folk music as a living tradition in Darwinian evolutionary terms in his classic 1972 book, Music and Society in Lowland Scotland in the 18th Century. Quote, Folk music is the product of a musical tradition that has been evolved through the process of oral transmission. The factors that shape the tradition are, one, continuity, which links the present with the past. Two, variation, which springs from the creative individual or the group. And three, selection by the community, which determines the form in which the music survives. Unquote. In rural, or we might even say rustic, communities, uninfluenced by classical music or art songs, <clears throat> we can understand how tunes and songs kept alive by repetition through generations would not only survive, but flourish, especially when the society remains stable. And just as today in our own experiences as ballad singers, we observe that the audience loves to hear the joyful songs, the work songs, and the hymns and gospel music, 
They also love to hear the songs that evoke empathy through tales of heartbreak and troubles of all kinds. The tunes and songs were about the lives of ordinary people. Folk songs are indeed the voice of the people. The Rackensack Folklore Society was formed in Mountain View in February 1963 when a group of concerned citizens met in the medical office of Dr. Lloyd Hollister to discuss the lack of jobs in Stone County. Attending was state representative and local businessman Eddie Walker, whose concern was especially the lack of basic community services in the county, such as a sound water system, improved roads, and better fire protection. Mr. Walker, a fiddle player and one of several other folk musicians who played weekly in Dr. Hollister's office, had invited John Oppitz of the Economic Development Commission to attend. Mr. Oppitz was present at this preliminary meeting, and after some discussion, he made an unusual suggestion that a large number of people who met regularly to play traditional Ozark music would need a meeting place, and that such a building could be the impetus for the founding of a folk culture center, which might be the stimulus for persuading the proper authority to fund at least an improved water system. Just two weeks later, another meeting took place to form a folk folklore society. Dr. Hollister was elected president. A former high school teacher, James Corbett Morris, who had become a nationally known singer-songwriter, better known as Jimmy Driftwood, was vice president. Jimmy suggested Rackensack Folklore Society as an appropriate name for the newly formed group and recommended a folk festival as an event that could bring attention to Mountain View by featuring the songs and tunes of Ozark players. A little aside here, across the country in the 1950s and 60s, a folk music revival was occurring and several other states had already established their own festivals. He also suggested a trade show of the arts and crafts that had been a part of the local culture for many generations and volunteered to organize and host the first festival, which was to be in April 1963, just two months away. Jimmy had just left the Grand Ole Opry to return, as he put it, quote, back to the Rackensack, that is, at home in north central Arkansas, unquote. He had already composed a number of hit songs, including the 8th of January, better known as the Battle of New Orleans, which won a Grammy Award. Others included North to Alaska, Wilderness Road, and Tennessee Stud. Here he's playing an unusually shaped guitar that was made by one of his relatives out of leftover wood from the headboard of a bed. Dozens of families and friends throughout Stone County came forward to join the newly organized Rackensack Folklore Society and to participate in the first annual Arkansas Folk Festival. It was a grand success, both artistically and financially, and indeed, eventually, it did lead to grants for a new water system and improved roads. Within just a few years, Mountain View became known as the folk music capital of the world. In 1973, just 10 years later, the Ozark Folk Center was opened with an auditorium that could seat over 1,000 people. Our chapter of Rack and Sack, that is the Pulaski County chapter, was also founded in 1963, just four months after the Mountain View beginning chapter. The leader down here was a good friend of Driftwood's, George Fisher, who would later become a renowned political cartoonist for the Arkansas Gazette. George owned property adjacent to Jimmy's place in the Timbo community of Stone County. Here are a couple of photos of George in his dual roles as a cartoonist in Little Rock and as a folk singer and guitarist up in Stone County back in the 60s. He's the one in the center with the guitar. 
he totally agreed with Jimmy on the importance of preserving the heritage of Ozark old-time music. On the right, with a variation on the washtub bass, is Frank Johnson, one of the founding members. His son, Jeff, now plays the musical saw at our meetings. And the man in the tree, I'm told, is former circuit judge David Bogard. Here's George and Jimmy and another founding member, Ken Blessing, on the fiddle. We'll see Ken later on with his daughter, Denise, another one of our fine fiddlers. In 1963, our Pulaski County chapter settled with the also recently formed Arkansas Art Center as a meeting location and met there on the first Monday of every month for 56 years until the art center closed for massive renovations in 2019. We then met at historic Curran Hall in Little Rock until it was shut down by the pandemic this past March. You can find Rack and Sack on Facebook and YouTube. We'll give you the internet addresses a little later. George Fisher also created bulletins in advance of the monthly meetings, <clears throat> usually featuring his cartoons of seasonal themes, such as this January one showing the New Year's baby with a fiddle and bow, and a July bulletin with marching musicians playing an auto harp, a wash tub, bass, and a harmonica. Here are two more one for October showing a Halloween party with another washtub bass, and also banjos and guitars, and one for November with a turkey tapping time and playing a fiddle, perhaps turkey in the straw. The musical instruments we play are mostly stringed, the fiddle and also the guitar, mandolin, banjo, auto harp, mountain dulcimer, the hammered dulcimer, which is very different, from a mountain dulcimer, and the bass fiddle. We also have the harmonica, accordion, and various flutes. There are a few unusual instruments, such as the musical saw and the dancing doll. We'll see them shortly. Also, the mouth harp, washtub bass, spoons, and bones. And we should remember that the unaccompanied human voice was an important part of the musical gatherings when the old ballads would be sung and listened to and thus memorized from one generation to the next. Were musical instruments brought to this country by the early settlers? The answer is yes. Fifes and flutes, French horns and trumpets that did not have valves, recorders, violins, various kinds of guitars, zithers, and hammered dulcimers. Some of these were rather difficult to reproduce without proper tools once the originals wore out. However, the resourceful pioneers were capable of constructing sound boxes and attaching strings to them, and the extant instruments testify to the importance of music in everyday life. The violin was the dominant instrument used at front porch gatherings of families and neighbors. But how about the fiddle? Hmm. The fact is, these instruments are one and the same. There is no difference. What actually evolved were the two words or names for the same instrument. The different names, violin and fiddle, came about probably because the two words were derived from the same Latin root, but changed as they went through different later languages. Fides was the Latin name for any kind of string, and fidicula was a diminutive for fides. In Old German, the stringed instrument's name was fidel. In Spain, the word became vihuela and then viola. In Old French, it was viel, and in Anglo-Saxon, fidele. This is a rather simple explanation for what is a lengthy etymology of these two terms. Speaking of fiddles, we've had fiddlers from one family in Rackensack from 1960, 1963 
to the present. That's 57 years. Here's Denise Blessing Heard with her father, the late Ken Blessing. Here's a very different bowed instrument, the musical saw, played by another second generation rack and sacker, Jeff Johnson. He uses a violin bow on the saw's straight edge and changes the pitch by bending the saw, more or less. The lovely sound is unusual, like that of some electronic instruments. Another unusual one is the dancing doll, a carved human figure hinged together and made to dance or keep percussive rhythm by tapping it on a wooden paddle. Here it's teamed up with a mountain dulcimer. The mountain dulcimer has a unique history. It is thought to be a truly American instrument. Some historians trace its origin within this country to the hills of Western Virginia, where it came into use in the early 1800s. A relatively easy instrument to make, with three or more strings stretched over a sound box that also holds a long fretboard, it has evolved into a graceful instrument that can be played just by holding it on the lap and strumming, and it has a sweet tone. The name dulcimer derives from the Latin dulce, which means, which means sweet. With its soft and ethereal tone, the mountain dulcimer soared in popularity during the nationwide folk music revival of the 1950s and 60s, and especially after Gene Ritchie introduced it at a New York City coffee house in the early 1950s. In Mountain View, the Max Spadden Dulcimer Shop has become famous worldwide as a maker and seller of fine mountain dulcimers. We have an award-winning mountain dulcimer player and instructor in Reverend Jim Munns. Another somewhat unusual stringed instrument is the auto harp. It was invented in Germany around 1880 but soon caught on in Pennsylvania and spread southward. Here are some more of our players. Gene Soji on guitar, our president Larry Cross on mandolin, Tara Ludwig and her banjo, and Dennis Cook on the hidden harmonica. It's somewhere in there, one of many instruments he plays. All the musical instruments we play are acoustic, that is, played without electric amplification attached to the instrument. That has become an understood ident identifier within the term old-time music and in folk music circles. Old-time is synonymous with traditional, harking back to the days and centuries before electrification, when family or neighbors gatherings would be fairly small and front porch music did not require a lot of volume to be heard. The biggest competition on a soft, quiet summer night would be what Jimmy Driftwood called the Ozark Symphony. That is, frogs, hoot owls, katydids, mockingbirds, and the baying of hounds chasing possums. However, we do use microphones when playing in venues larger than front porches, or for audiences larger than the immediate family. But what about the songs and tunes themselves? Where can we look for their origins and for the variations they must have gone through over the centuries in the old world? Of course, Americans created their own songs about their lives in the new country, cowboy songs, railroad songs, lumber and mining songs, gospel and blues, soldiers, sailors, and war songs, and working on the farm songs. As you know, provenance is an important word in determining the actual source and history of any object, especially an antique, but there is obvious difficulty in determining provenance of a folk song because of its ephemeral oral performance and transmission and the reinterpretations that occur after listening and then repeating the song and passing it along. Here we must depend on dated, or at least roughly datable, written accounts. 
These include mentions in passing in early literature and also luckily preserved ephemeral printed matter. And there are scholarly collections. As early as 1765, Bishop Thomas Percy, a former chaplain to King George III, published his Relics of Ancient English Poetry, now known as Percy's Relics, which was a collection of historical and lyrical ballads. Sir Walter Scott read this work in his youth and was inspired to publish in 1802 his own collection of ballads entitled Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border. A more scholarly approach to collection, editing, and publication was achieved by Harvard professor Francis James Child with his great collection entitled The English and Scottish Popular Ballads, now known as Child Ballads. He assigned numbers to each song, and they are now sometimes referred to as, for example, Child Ballad 456, and so forth. His work was actually an anthology of traditional ballads from England and Scotland and their American variants. This early song, a folk song treasure, was published by Houghton Mifflin in New York in eight volumes starting in 1882 and extending to 1898. These early efforts in preserving the ancient ballads and folk music lead us right up to the 20th century and our American versions. Thanks to Thomas Edison and others, recording equipment became available. We owe a tremendous debt to the early collectors who recorded on heavy and cumbersome equipment those performers who were willing to sing into their recording instruments for preservation's sake. So much would have been lost without the early efforts of Cecil J. Sharp, Carl Sandburg, and John Lomax and his son Alan Lomax, to name just a few. Sharp had founded an early 20th century folk song revival in England and collected thousands of songs there. He later came to the United States and collected and recorded folk music in the Appalachians, including Eastern Kentucky. The famous poet Carl Sandburg not only collected folk songs, he was also a respected folk singer. He published a volume called The American Song Bag in 1927, and it has been reprinted several times. The Lomaxes traveled widely with recording equipment, including trips down south to record lots of African-American blues and gospel music. Arkansas has had its own recognized collectors, notably Vance Randolph and his wife Mary Parlor, who documented and recorded folk songs in the Ozarks of northwestern Arkansas and southern Missouri. Their materials are archived at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Also, John Quincy Wolfe, Jr., during his long teaching career in, career in Memphis, used his summers from 1952 to 1970 to record and document folk music in the Ozark Hills within a 50-mile radius of Batesville. When he died in 1972, his wife, Bess Millen Wolf, donated his entire collection of musical tapes to the Lyon College Regional Studies Center, where a very fine archive has been established. This online listening archive provides not only the words, but also audio recordings of the named singers and is available to everyone. At the very first Arkansas Folk Festival in Mountain View in 1963, many examples of the old world ballads and tunes and more recent American ones were heard. The players and singers were families and friends from all around Stone County well known for their fine ability to play and sing the old songs that had been passed down in their families. No music stands were needed to provide the lyrics, <laughs> no amplifi amplification for their acoustic instruments, just the microphone in the old high school 
where the festival was held that first year. And remarkably, their performances did not vanish into the thin mountain air, but were recorded by John Quincy Wolf Jr. More recently, his recordings were remastered and transferred to a CD, which is available from the Maybe Simpson Library at Lyon College in Batesville. The excellent liner notes are by Drs. Brooks Blevins and W.K. McNeil, both prominent folklorists of the Appalachians and especially the Ozarks. Fast forward 57 years and we may ask the question, who are our players now? We have a great representation of talented people in our group. Several of our musicians are indeed second and third generation rack and sack players. Some had early formal music training and some have learned to play from friends in the old tradition of shared talent. We have among our players, attorneys, church music directors, farmers, teachers, architects, auto mechanics, physicians, realtors, professional writers, and lab technicians, to name just a few. Here are some of us in a smaller venue, Historic Curran Hall, where we played for several meetings in 2019 and early this year until the virus closed it down. There's another unusual uh, instrument here. Markey's paired string double aught tenor guitar was specially made for her. But no matter what instruments we play or what the story or background is for each of our players, we have a unifying love for old time music and a mutual desire to preserve it and keep it alive for new generations. In closing, I want to thank the producer of this video, my good friend and fellow rack and sack player, Denise Blessing Hurd. I also wish to thank my husband, Marvin D. Jeter, who created the slide program. Also, a big thank you to Gene Soji, who provided many of the photographs and the recorded music videos. And a special thank you to all the Rack and Sack Folklore Society musicians, members, and supporters who provide their talent and their time whenever called upon. As we usually do, we'll close with a brief hoedown. That is, a video from recent performances featuring the old favorite Ragtime Annie, followed by I'll Fly Away, sung a cappella with the Curran Hall audience participating. Thank <laughs> you.